This is Nick Blackshaw on behalf of Skerritt Media interviewing Mr. Colin Baker with regards to Menston Green. How did you become involved with um, Menston Green and what attracted you to the production? Well, I became involved with Menston Green when I got an, uh, an email from my agent saying a young man in Leeds had, uh, well, I didn't know he was a young man then, a man in Leeds had approached him and uh, asked me if I was interested in doing this script. And I asked to see the script and I read it. And I thought it was uh, entertaining and different and looked like fun to do. And the recording schedule enabled me to, because I'm currently doing a play on tour, so uh, the schedule allowed me to come up to Leeds and do it on a Sunday. So uh, up I popped. And uh, I've had a very pleasant day here with uh, lots of people I've never met before, <laughs> including the very talented writer, author, director, tea maker, juggler, um, young person impressionist, Alex Skerritt, <laughs> um, who has a great future behind in front of him. Uh, I nearly said behind him, didn't I? It was like uh, like his script, humorous. Um, no, it's been great fun to do. Um, it's a good setup here, and uh, we've had a lovely morning. What can you tell listeners about your character then, Mr. Mr. Cutler? Well, I'm not going to tell you too much about Mr. Cutler. You've got to listen to the programme. But Mr. Cutler is uh, the producer of a TV series, which... Uh, um, is uh, a popular soap, uh, or perhaps it's not popular enough soap. Uh, um, it, it's slipping in the ratings a bit, and things are, uh, have to happen. And uh, he appoints somebody else as a producer, and uh, is then elevated himself to the head of series, serials, and uh, rodeos. <laughs> that interesting, uh, ironic title. Um, and he waits to see if the new producer can stay on the bucking bronco, basically. And uh, the way that the story unfolds is very humorous. So just to talk a little bit about the approach that you take to sort of creating characters then. So are you traditional in that you stick to the details of the script or do you try and bring in other elements to make your sort of parts interesting? Uh, what a very deep and penetrating question. <laughs> um, like all scripts, what you do is there's two things fighting or hopefully coalescing against or with each other. One is the script and the part, and the other is you, the performer. And somehow you put the two into a into a large box and shake them up and see what happens. Yeah. So I don't consciously ever try and overlay something on top that shouldn't be there. But hopefully when you read a script, as in the case with this one, you find things in there that give you a clue as to who the character is. Yes. And you press the create button and see what happens. Mm. And and hopefully Alex will be pleased with what he's, uh, um, what I've given him. Which, interestingly enough, leads on to the next question. What approach does Alex take as a director? Well, he, he directs, yeah. uh, quite rightly too. Um, he, he He's also in the piece. Yeah. And that also adds a, an extra um, dimension to it because... It is quite hard sometimes to be in something and to be objective about it, but uh, he seems to have managed to uh, accommodate that quite well. Very well, indeed. And uh, he's uh, he's just there, um, and we do it till we got it right, and then we move on and do some more. Uh, I, I do a lot of audio, of course, because yeah. I do the big finish audios, which yes. is the Doctor Who stuff. So I'm, I'm used to the, the speed and the precision that's required mm. when you're doing audio work. I love it because you don't <laughs> have to learn it. Yes, it's brilliant. usually an advantage, definitely. It, yeah. So does do you feel that, does Alex have what, what he wants in mind and then if you come up with something better, then... Well, he has the advantage of having uh, uh, been the writer. Yeah. So if you've written something and you're the director, there's no tension there between writer and director because you can get occasions where the, if the writer is sitting there and the director is saying mm. one thing and the writer has a different idea about it, but as the the two are the one in this case, yes. uh, that, that is a, a very useful short circuit. I think pretty much um, what he's written has given me all that I need to um, create the part. I think there was one moment when we were recording it that I suggested something and he was kind enough to um, accept it. Yeah. And uh, whether he cuts it out afterwards is another <laughs> matter, but he did at least uh, go, oh, yes, that's a good idea. So he's open and flexible, which is yes. which is always nice. I hate working with rigid people. It's interesting for me to hear that because I've worked with Alex before on other productions and been a close friend. I don't know if he was just being sort of kind to me and just seeing what <laughs> what other. Well, I think, it, I think he's he a kind his... fellow. Absolutely, and I just wondered what approach he had to other performers. 
Next question then. So as someone with a background doing sort of offbeat cult programs such as Doctor Who, Blake Seven, Jonathan Creek, that kind of thing, do you actively look for projects that have that sort of cult flavour to them then? No. 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 I'm afraid they come to me. Ah. Uh, well, I, well, am I afraid? No, I'm not afraid. But they come to me. Uh, once you are um, deemed to be a cult, um, <laughs> you, you tend to move in cult territory. Yes. Um, so... Uh, things that are you know, offbeat, off the wall, sci-fi, fantasy, um, you know, push the boundaries of imagination, tend to come in my direction. But it's quite nice to do something comedic for a change. Yes, and then for what, for want of a better phrase, I, I, I pondered about this statement, but we'll go with it anyway. So, as an elder statesman of uh. sort of cult <laughs> programs, so how do you feel about the current state of? cult programming across sort of TV and radio and so forth. I'm envious. I am so <laughs> envious. When I was doing Doctor Who in the mid-80s, uh, it was really... The BBC was not proud of having Doctor Who on the airwaves because sci-fi and fantasy were a little bit embarrassing. Yes, it was successful, but, oh dear, it's not proper drama. It's not mm. the Wednesday play. And then suddenly we've had a spate of programmes like uh, Life on Mars and and the one where Nicholas Lindhurst travels backwards and forwards from the war and back. Good night, sweetheart. Good night, sweetheart. All of them involving a, a fantasy or sci-fi element. Yes. And suddenly they're mainstream. And suddenly Doctor Who has been allowed to become mainstream as well. So the, the kind of attention and pride that is lavished on those programmes now didn't exist in the 80s. Uh, and I'm very envious, but thank goodness, because it's all drama. I mean, for heaven's sake, you know, the, the, it's all about the imagination, whether it's Coronation Street or whether it's Life on Mars or Doctor Who. It's one person's imagination and putting people into a situation uh, that is entertaining to watch. Um, sci-fi and fantasy have now become kind of acceptable. Thank yes, goodness. Thank goodness. Absolutely. And following on from that then, what makes radio the ideal format for, su for such cult programming off the back of things like your big finish work? Well, it's cheaper. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Set, de set design and special effects. I mean, you know, if somebody says on radio, that is the most beautiful woman I have ever seen, every person listening will have a different mental picture. So it works for all of them. Whereas if you sit on a television set and the camera you know, turns on and looks at the woman he's talking about and they go, well, I don't think she's all that. <laughs> or, yeah. Phew. Uh, everyone has a different idea. So yes. you, you can say, my goodness, that planet has split in two and a 10 million f foot monster is pouring out <laughs> of it, devouring all in front of it. And you're there. It's in your Absolutely, head. Yeah. And that's what radio is brilliant at. Yeah. And I am young and slim sometimes <laughs> um, and, and boyish and I can even be girlish on radio. <laughs> um, it, it, it's just limitless because its only restriction is the imagination of the listener. And some of the best experiences I've ever had have been audio plays. I have sat in my car, having arrived at my destination, listening to a play on radio and been late for whatever I was going for because I wanted to hear the end. Yeah. I don't recall doing that much for telly. So do you feel that you have um, an image that you want listeners to get of your character in Menston? No, Green? no, Are you it's quite what happy to... It's, I let the words speak for themselves and Mr. Cutler will uh, hopefully be... Uh, there'll be as many different Mr. Cutlers in their heads as there are possibilities. Final question from the, me then, Colin, is would you consider Menston Green to be in league with all these sort of other cult programmes that are out there at the moment? Well, maybe we don't want to be a cult. I mean, because cult does imply that it's uh, it's a minority of viewers that enjoy it. That is kind of goes hand in hand with being a cult. Whereas I think this is good enough to be mainstream. Um, I think you know mainstream radio uh, would benefit from having something like this. I'd, there's a lot of uh, comedy on radio at the moment. Yes, some of it's a bit out on a limb. Mm. Um, some of it I struggle to understand. I, I think this. Um, could become a bridge between cult and mainstream. Absolutely, so and there I'd, are. I'd vote for that. Yeah, there are other programs out there, such as like the League of Gentlemen and yes. Little Britain, that have their footing in radio to begin with, and then they've made that transition. Yeah. So absolutely, I feel there is a future for Menston Green there. Well, there Colin you are. Baker. Let's see. Thank you very much. Thank you.